Thank you for that, Reagan. If you would please take your Bibles and open to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. We're going to be looking at verses 14 through 21 this morning. Mark 8, verses 14 through 21. There was an article in the Smithsonian Magazine a number of years ago entitled, The Great Uprising, How a Powder Revolutionized Baking. And they're celebrating the invention of baking powder, which does not really seem like something that anybody would celebrate for any reason whatsoever. But it's easy to forget how much that has actually changed the world in which we now live and, and, and the food that we now eat. Um, the reality is it's just become so ubiquitous, so everywhere, that we fail to notice it or even appreciate it. But it was actually invented by a chemist back in the 1840s and, and you know, combining a few really basic ingredients. And over the course of time, of course, they became much cheaper and much easier to produce and, and, uh, and it became very popular. But prior to that, you know, uh, it required, if you wanted leavened bread or something that would rise or expand on its own, you needed to use yeast. It wasn't a chemical leavener like baking powder is. It was actually a, uh, a living organism, so to speak. And the, it wouldn't, you couldn't just go to the store and pick up that, you know, that little yellow envelope or the little jar and you keep it on the... It was something you literally had to make some dough and always you'd keep back a piece of that dough and then bake whatever you had. And there's always that piece that you kind of literally had to keep alive, sometimes putting juice on it or other like sugary liquids on there to kind of keep it alive. And the problem is, if you didn't do that just right, there could be consequences down the line for that. And sometimes going so far as just, you know, kind of altering the overall flavor of whatever it was that you were making. Plus, it could even at times be toxic and, and potentially even kill you. You know, and you thought gluten was bad for you, let alone this deadly yeast they used to have. But that was still kind of the way that it was, and it was just a risk that people were, were willing to make. And it was, but it was hard, it was difficult, and very, very slow process in order to leaven your bread. And we sometimes forget that fact. And it's because of brands like Calumet and Clabber Girl that are still around to this day, but early on, they were the ones that came around and became almost baking powder empires. And there was actually like a wars, so to speak, fighting and, and advertising and other things over baking powder. Who had the best one? Which one was going to kill you? All these other things that are going on that are, that are truly laughable in this day and age, but that's the way it was done back then. But it highlights a little bit better for us and when we come to Scripture, when we come across the ideas of leaven or specifically yeast in, in Scripture, it had a much more sinister kind of um, look to it than we sometimes look at that. We think of leaven and yeast, we're just like, well, yeah, we use that all the time. What's the big deal? And we get the picture not realizing and forgetting some of the history where things didn't always turn out the way that you wanted them to. Sometimes what you put in your bread was literally going to make you sick and it would kill you and it was a very small thing and yet it permeated it's a much larger ops, uh, object and ruins all of it. We need to kind of be, get back into that picture, that understanding that we find uh, here to, to understand truly passages like the one that we're having today. It is such a small thing, and it can have a great impact. And there are many things in life that are very, very small that we can look at and say, that's inconsequential, or that really just doesn't matter. And the fact of the matter is, it matters a lot because it changes the whole of a person. There's nothing really in Scripture that we can come across as, you know, that's just small, that doesn't matter, because, well, at the end of the day, it does. And we want to see that for us this morning. And today we're going to find that the leaven that Jesus is going to talk about is not just affecting the Pharisees, but it's actually affecting the disciples themselves in a very real and meaningful way. And it's going to have disastrous results if it continues on going in this direction. And what we find is, as we bring this to our own selves and understanding is that sometimes we, we forget God's past provisions in our lives. And when we do that, it is a sure sign that unbelief has permeated deep within ourselves and actually danger is close by. And so that's what we're going to see in our text this morning. So let's read verses 14 through 21, and we'll, we'll go from there. It says this, Now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they only had one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not listen? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, Twelve. And the seven of the four thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, Seven. And they said to them, Do you not yet understand? 
unbelief in the life of the religious secular. It's a conversation all about bread. It's actually kind of funny to look at some of the various stories in Scripture and realize how, how much of a central element or key player bread actually becomes. And of course we have the feedings of the 5,000 and the 4,000, but there's the Passover and there's other places where bread just kind of shows up in various places in, 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 in meaningful ways. So it's not uncommon to see it, but it is certainly a central element in the story that we're unfolding today that Jesus is going to base this all off of. And verse 14 really just acts like some background information. They had forgotten to grab some on their way out. I mean, it's not really surprising. They were kind of in a hurry when they were leaving from the previous, their previous place. And they got on there, and they have one loaf on this boat for 13 people. And that loaf is not the kind of loaves that we would think, typically think of, like a larger loaf of, um, you know, that you find in a, in a modern-day grocery store, even though you would bake for a family. It was probably more along the lines of like a large bun. Something, you know, not very big, especially when you have to split among 13 guys. And, uh, and so it's not going to go very far. And they know this. They know this. They're maybe not in the beginning sure that Jesus knows this, but they know this. And I think they're maybe a little sensitive to it. And so Jesus goes from, from you know, this, we have this background information. And then Jesus makes this comment in verse 15 and says, hey, watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And so this is the beginning of this story. And Jesus tells them this. And the disciples, like we are so prone to do ourselves, completely misunderstand what in the world Jesus is talking about. Maybe you've been in conversations like that. With my, I, I wish I could think of something off the top of my head. But, you know, somebody makes a comment and you think, wait, what? And, and you're thinking this and they're talking about this and you're not on the same page and it takes like a long time before you realize, oh, oh I was thinking you meant this over here and you, you finally get on the same page. Well, that's kind of where the disciples are right now. They're in total left field about what's going on. And they think at some level that Jesus is rebuking them for the fact that they've only gotten one loaf of bread on this boat. And uh, we can kind of hear that in Jesus's, in Jesus's comment if we add to that more of a sarcastic tone, like, so you guys are trying to avoid the leaven of the Pharisees, are we, by, not ma by making sure there's no bread on the boat? Good job, guys. I, I think that's what they heard. That's what they heard. And instead of realizing, no, Jesus is actually trying to tell you something. He's not rebuking you. He's telling you something. And they're not getting it. See, what Jesus is doing is the same thing that many of us can do and probably have done. Sometimes there's just that lull in what's going on around you, and you can take advantage to have a conversation or, or, or strike a teachable moment, and that's what they're doing. They've left the Pharisees behind. Remember in verses 11 through 13, when we looked at that, that, that small and brief interaction, the Pharisees had come to Jesus, they met him on the shore, and said, hey, we want a sign. We want a sign, something big, something massive. Show us this. Give us a sign that you are really who you say you are. They're trying to discredit Jesus. And Jesus basically says, you'll get a sign over my dead body. Jumps in the boat and takes off. That's where they were. And he leaves. And so they didn't really have a lot of time on land to probably gather bread or anything else. But Jesus is warning them now, based on that conversation, you have to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. It's this teachable moment, this lull. They're just on a boat. They were just on a boat, but they're on a boat again. Let's do something with this time. Let's redeem it. But when Jesus warns these guys about this leaven, what, what is that leaven? We have to define this for ourselves as we understand this passage, or we'll miss sight of what's going on here. Now, leaven in Scripture, I think as you probably well know, is almost universally looked down upon as, as being negative. It was negative. They used it all the time in various things, but they looked at it as negative, that this, it could permeate and kind of tra change the overall substance of what it was going into. So it looked negative as a great illustration of sin and many other things, and it still is. But Jesus doesn't elaborate specifically here what this leaven of the Pharisees is. Now, if you do some research in your Bible, especially going through the Gospels, you'll find leaven identified in a couple of different places in a couple of different ways. At times, it's the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. And that certainly fits, because they were hypocrites all day long. So that makes sense. It's also sometimes identified as their teaching. And certainly their teaching led to a lot of their hypocrisy, because they weren't actually consistent with the things that they taught. But even in their teaching, they were constantly going to the law and then elaborating and extrapolating all kinds of uh, sundry laws and additions to the law and things that were just like really out of this world and impossible to keep. And they made it a burden to the people. So certainly their teaching qualifies specifically as leaven. But we don't find either of those things here. 
But when we look at the nearest context of the recent, most recent interaction that Jesus has had with just with these guys, what we find is neither teaching nor hypocrisy, but unbelief. It is their unbelief, I believe, in this context that we're looking at. They refuse to believe Jesus. They want more signs. They want cosmic wonders. They want massive things. Prove to us that you are, in fact, the Messiah or Jesus or that, Jesus, or that God supports you or is behind you. And Herod, too, is kind of a surprise addition in our text to find that out. But you do remember the little bit we know about Herod in the Gospels. The, the one interaction that we have seen is the fact that Herod has heard that Jesus is about and walking about and doing some amazing things. And Herod's assumption is that this is a resurrected John the Baptist. He doesn't believe either. So there's, there's something they both have in common. And so whereby the other two things, teaching and hypocrisy, are true, I think in our immediate context, the unbelief is what's being mentioned here. And it is one of the main reasons why they were so obstinate towards Jesus. They didn't like him. They didn't like him. They didn't believe that he really was who he said he was. And that's going to be our focus here. Now, unbelief is not just a description. We have to understand that it's not just simply a description of those who question or even deny God's existence. Because we can look at this and think, okay, so they're atheists. But they're religious leaders. They're Pharisees. They, they can't be atheists. So we have to make the distinction between un, and what unbelief really is. Because unbelief is not a denial in the existence of God. The Pharisees certainly believed in God. But what they didn't do was believe Him. Do you understand the difference? belief in something versus believing him. Because that's what's going on here. They believe that he exists, but when he tells them something or he's giving them instruction, they don't believe and therefore follow through with what he has said or what he has declared. We'll kind of elaborate that a little bit more as we go through this, but there are plenty of people in this day and age that would deny the existence of God. There are plenty of those people, whether atheists, agnostics, or, or many other people, they just don't think that God exists. But we're really not focusing on them. Their, their problem is still unbelief, but it's more of a fundamental kind of an unbelief that they're struggling with. But there, here we have the Pharisees, these religious leaders who don't believe God. They don't take Him at His word. There's a giant question that is resolving around them, which is surprising for us because they're very religious people living very irreligiously. And you wouldn't think that that's possible, but they're demonstrating for us very clearly that it is. And that is one thing that many religious and even secular people have in common. They do not believe God. They do not believe what He says. They do not believe what He has done. There are a lot of people that do that. Now, it's not surprising when we come across an atheist who doesn't believe God, because they don't believe in Him either, but it is when we come across religious. And that should concern all of us. Because the unbelief of these religious, this secular religious group is clearly on display, but the disciples are being put out and lumped into that same camp. They're beginning to demonstrate the very same type of unbelief that the Pharisees are. And they don't even realize it. And they don't even know it. And this is where the warning for us really starts to come into play here that we need to take note of because we're in danger of becoming the same kind of enemies of God that the Pharisees were by this sense of unbelief. So looking more at verse 16 and following, we see where what's going on here. And we very quickly realize the disciples are suffering from a form of amnesia. They don't remember. They don't remember what's going on here. And I'm probably going to call them Christians or, or something along that line or technically not, don't fit that definition at this moment in time. They will, but not now. But we'll just call them that because I'll probably mess that up anyway. So just stay off my back. All right. But it's almost as if on cue, Jesus finishes this comment. They completely misunderstand and they start discussing among themselves what's going on and, and talking about this. And they're, they're kind of like kids. I thought you were going to get the bread. No, I got it last time. I thought you were supposed to get it. No, John was supposed to get it. You know, it's like the back seat in every road trip you ever take. You know, everybody's blaming and pointing fingers at everybody else. And that's what they're doing in the back of the boat. They're, they're blaming each other. He's mad. We didn't get any bread. He's hungry. What they don't realize is they are quite literally demonstrating the unbelief that Jesus has just warned them is present in the Pharisees. They're demonstrating it in their argument. They're demonstrating this unbelief. That discussion, that word discussion, seems like such a benign word, doesn't it? 
And it is in and of itself neutral, but when we find that word discussion in Mark, it's almost always with, I think it's always with a group of people that are discussing something, talking about something that Jesus just said, and they're trying to resolve it without asking, actually asking Jesus what he meant by it. Pharisees do it all the time, but right here we find it with the disciples. What's going on? They missed it. Jesus is not upset with them. He's not upset for them, with them for not having any more bread than just, you know, this roll. And look at the questions. And he just rapid fire. Jesus asks all these questions. And, and you can almost just see Jesus asking these questions and like rubbing his temples at the same time. Like, oh, guys, come on. Really? Really? Like, you don't get it? And you've heard that old adage, you know, it's hard to fly like an eagle when you're surrounded by turkeys. The disciples are playing the part of a turkey. They really are. They really, and Jesus, thankfully, is, is so patient with them. And the reality is all of us play that part from time to time. And we can realize the fact that God is patient with us as, they're, as, as we're growing and maturing and, 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 and getting to where we need to be. Because the disciples, let's be honest, they're not yet what they ought to be, but neither are we. And yet God is patient with us. And it's the same kind of a patience that we should be exhibiting towards one another as we're growing and, and striving to follow after Christ. But we can sum up all these questions at six or seven, depending on how you want to count them. But we can almost sum up those, the answer to those questions like, like this. Don't you remember all the things that you have seen and heard? Don't you remember all these things? And then Jesus, we know specifically what he's talking about because he goes, and again, it, it supports the fact that Mark wasn't just recycling, you know, like these stories of feeding the 5,000 and 4,000. We talked about that. You know, like it might have been, people say, like, that's the same story. He just recycled it. No, 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 no. Jesus clearly is indicating these are very separate events. He says, don't you remember what I just did with the 5,000 people? Don't you just remember what I did with the 4,000 people? I think the point of the question is kind of like, no, but... He goes, I fed all those people with a handful of bread. And it was not a problem. Why are you arguing as if having one roll in the boat is a problem for me? The man to bread ratio right now is pretty good. It's 1 to 13. I mean, that's not great. We would never sit down to, be di to dinner and be excited by that. But, you know, previously it was like 1 to 5,000. Right, so the, the whole bread demand ratio is vastly improved from what it has been before. It's not great, but it's improved. He says, but if it wasn't a problem for me to feed 5,000 men with five loaves of bread, why do you think it's going to be a problem for me to feed 13 of us with one? Do you not remember? How can you not understand this? This is not a problem for me. It's not a problem for me. And yet you doubt that I can provide for you the same way that I provided for all of those other people. The, fact, the way I provided for even you yourselves because you all ate it. And the fact of the matter is that after I was done providing both times, you had more after than you did when you started. This is not a problem for me. The only problem I see here is that you refuse to believe that I can do this for you or that I can do it again. See, they suffered, suffered from amnesia. They forgot that God can do again what he's done in the past. And unfortunately, that's a common ailment for a lot of us. It is surprising that the disciples have the same base problem that the Pharisees and Herod do. And it is one of unbelief. Now, it's a different underlying cause of that unbelief, but it's still unbelief. And what they need, what both of them need, and what we need is something called future grace. The future grace in a nutshell is just simply this, that I will continue to believe by faith that God will continue to do in the future what he has always been or done or provided in the past. See, our past informs what's going to happen in the future. It's the reason for why I can continue to trust God, because I can look backwards and see God has been faithful. God has been there. He has done these things. And when we fail over that, that is when we question and ultimately stop believing God and inevitably sin in some capacity or in some way. Now that definition of future grace is simple. It's not really earth shattering and yet the implications that it has are absolutely massive. They really are. But it does explain why at some level disbelief is the root problem. 
We question the promises of God. We question the faithfulness of God. We don't question belief in God. We just stop believing God and what He's promised for us in His Word. And we can clearly see that in the wilderness generation. In fact, I'll have you turn there because I'd, I'd love for you to spend some time in it maybe this afternoon over lunch or over the dinner table. But Numbers chapter 14. We can kind of see this laid out for ourselves and we'll actually uh, reference a verse in just a moment. But Numbers chapter 14 we begin seeing this common problem going on even in the wilderness generation. And someone to say, well, the failures of the Israelites as they're wandering through the wilderness, they've been delivered from Egypt, they've been in the wilderness for a while, is really one of ingratitude. Now, you can make that argument and you can make that claim, and at the end of the day, I'm sure they actually kind of were. You know, God has been providing for them over and over and over again, both in bread and in other contexts, the, the, the plagues, getting them out of Egypt and everything else. But, you know, what's interesting is that we make that assertion sometimes. Ingratitude is the reason why we should serve God. And, ingratitude, and, and ingratitude is the reason why we sometimes sin against God. And that feels reasonable at some level. The problem is we really don't find that concept or that truth in Scripture anywhere. It's not one of gratitude or the lack thereof. In fact, it's actually something else. It's a lack of belief. Now, when you look at Numbers chapter 14, what you'll find is in the previous chapter, in, in Numbers 13, what has just gone on is the 12 spies have just finished spying out the city of Jericho. Ten are coming back and saying, don't even think about going in there. We are going to lose and lose badly. In the beginning of chapter 14, then, the people are like, Oh, why have you, God, have you brought us out here? We need a new leader, and we're going back to Egypt. We're hightailing it out of there. And this whole conversation is going on here. And then drop down to Numbers 14, verse 11. And notice what it says. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will those people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me? In spite of all the signs that I have done, among them. What is it? What is their root problem? Is it one of gratitude according to our passage? No. It is a lack of belief. It's a lack of belief. They're making the suggestion that God is a liar. He's not going to get us in there. They're making the suggestion that God has brought us out of Egypt to bring us to the wilderness to kill us. To let us die. After all the things that they have seen. All the things that they have seen. And, and mind you, it, it's not just the ten plagues and everything else. Like Every single day they wake up and they look out and what is residing over the tabernacle? A pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. They can see that. You can't wake up and see that every morning. Oh, that's normal. That's not normal. That's not normal. And almost on cue, again, you, you, you know, that thing transitions you know, from, from, the, the, from the cloud and suddenly it's fire. And some, from, the, from the fire in the morning, it's suddenly the cloud again. It's constantly transitioning back and forth. And it's just hovering over there. They're not putting fuel on it. They're not doing anything. It's, there's a constant reminder of the presence of God in that camp. He's with them. And He's there. And he's real. And He's been doing all these things for them. Bread is showing up six days a week for them to eat. I've done all these things for you. And you refuse to believe me. You refuse to believe me. So much so you want to go back because you actually think Egypt was better than what's going on right here. It was a refusal to believe. They had seen and they would heard so much and yet they failed to understand and remember as our text says about the disciples here. So the reality is that God has made a promise. He's actually made many promises to us. And by their actions, they're calling God a liar. Now, they weren't Christians, per se, but they were certainly believers. They were God-fearers, or Jews, or however we want to phrase that. And yet, they did not believe Him. And over and over again, the God's constant refrain over that generation, that wilderness generation, was that they were faithless. You do not believe. In spite of all that I have done for you, you do not believe. Which is why memory is such a big deal. Memory is such a big deal for them specifically. Think about all the feasts in ancient Israel that they were supposed to have in honor. Why? It was to aid their memory, lest they forget. All of those things. 
the Passovers and the, the Feast of Tabernacles, all those things, they were there designed to help them remember. The symbolism even baked into the very best of the vestments of the priest. They had the 12 stones in there. There was a reminder. God said, I will make of you a, a mighty nation to Abraham. And here's the 12 tribes of results that they are all are to the promises that God had made to them. The fact that they can have a relationship with God, that priest is able to go in and make uh, sacrifices for their sins that they might enjoy forgiveness. It was all there. The, 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 the way the tabernacle was constructed and the symbolism baked into that as well. It was all there designed to help them remember and yet they were constantly forgetting. Why is it so important? It's important to remember because it builds our faith. We can look backwards at our life and the things that God has put there and the things that God has done in His faithfulness and His provision and His being there. And we can look at that and say, look, God has been faithful and He has proven Himself over and over and over again. And so now I turn around and I'm facing this brand new obstacle over here and I don't know how this is going to play out. And yet I know based on that faithfulness that I can go forward and God is going to be here and I can trust Him. And I can trust Him. And Jesus is looking at these guys, do you not understand? I, this, this bread, this roll is not a problem for me. I can do this. Why won't you believe? Why won't you understand? All the things that I've been showing you have been there designed to build your faith. And you're not getting it. And it's so surprising to us here a little bit because they're not the Pharisees. They're unlike the Pharisees. They like Jesus. They're an antagonist. They're hanging out with them. They follow him. They like him, and yet, the, uh, the, uh, and they're against the Pharisees, and yet they're dangerously close to the same kind of unbelief that the Pharisees have. They need to move what they know from theory to practice, and so do we. Because in so many of our, 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 our homes, and even our minds and our hearts, what we know about God is this theoretical, like we should do this, but when it gets to the point where we actually have to do it, it goes to the practical. Sometimes it feels like there's something that like short circuits, like the wire breaks, and it can't transfer over all the time. And we're like, oh, I don't know what to do. It has to go from theory to practice, from the theoretical to the practical. And this is unfortunately still a common element for many of us. And this is where it really hits home, because many of us still struggle with unbelief in various ways and, and places, and we don't even realize it. And when we do, we fall into sin. Really, probably every time. Here's a couple of examples that might be helpful to illustrate this. Anxiety is a big one. I think our country in and of itself is racked with anxiety, especially now with things that are going on. But anxiety is really a fear that God will fail to provide for us or fail to do something for us that we need Him to do in a specific and meaningful way. It could be food, it could be health, it could be safety, it doesn't matter. And yet it's something that, that is easily you know, uh, found in, in, and I wouldn't even say life of Christians, just life. There's a lot of things to be anxious over. There's a lot of things to worry over. And yet the cure to that is trust in God. This trust in this future grace that God will continue to be for us what we need Him to be. I won't have you turn there, but you can look at it. You'll be familiar with the passage anyway. Matthew chapter 6. It's the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus actually takes some time to kind of flesh some of these things out for us. And it's so easy. We get so familiar with those verses, we fail to hear them sometimes. And yet when Jesus is talking to them, when he says that the people are worried about their worried about their clothing, they're worried about their food, and they're worried about shelter. He says, Don't worry about this. I know you you have need of these things. And, and specifically verse 30 says, But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye you of little faith? You of little faith. You're worried about what you're going to wear. You're worried that you're not going to have enough. And he says, your worry is based in a lack of belief. Not in gratitude. Not any of those other things. It's a lack of belief. Anxiety, at the end of the day, is a faith problem. It's not a belief in God problem. There's many people that believe in God and struggle with anxiety. And as he says in this passage, how many of you can add even an hour to your life by being, and guess what word he uses? Anxious. Add an hour to your life by worrying about it. 
Now, you can try it if you want to, and the only thing you might add to your life is more gray hair, but I don't think that's really what you're after. But he says, how many of you, by, by worrying about these things, can add life to yourself? And the reality is you can't. Instead, 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast that anxiety on God, casting all your anxieties on, God, on Him because He cares for you. He's asking you, hey, give it to me. I'll take it. I'll take care of it. He's telling us what to do. And it's not just simply don't do it. Because he knows we're going to. We're going to be worried about these things. We're going to be concerned about these things. But he says, when you find it, you take it. And in faith, give it to me. Let me worry about it. Let me take care of it. And he takes it. He takes it. See, future grace looks at anxiety and says, in faith, I will trust God, that God will continue to do for me and be for me what I need him to be and do. What he's always done in the past. I can trust him. And it doesn't necessarily mean, that, okay, I'm going to trust him, and now God's going to give me what I need right here, right now, or what I think I need. You see, that's not, what, that's not how it works. We're not getting into this whole uh, health and wealth gospel kind of a thing. It's not that. We might be very surprised how God answers the request that we bring before him, how he shows us the, his sufficiency. But that God will give me what I need, not necessarily what I want reorient our ideas. We need to see Jesus and be satisfied in Him. Now, I'm no doctor. And I suppose it needs to be said that there are plenty of people that are in this world that are on some form of medication or considering maybe even a medication because anxiety is racking with them and deep down inside. Okay, I'm not telling you to stop taking your meds or it's sinful to do that. I'm not saying those things. Hear me, okay? But what I would do is say this. I would encourage you, as you're going forward in this, take, consider adding future grace, the idea of future grace, trusting in God to your regiment of fighting your anxiety. I think you will be surprised by the result. When you truly take your cares and your concerns and your anxieties and say, oh Lord, I don't know how or what in the world you're going to do with this but I'm going to trust you with that anyway, and then go from that, making it, moving it from that theoretical to the practical, watch what God does. Watch what God does. And understand, it's a constant fight. It's not just, me, okay, I gave it to him, and wow, this is great, and I'll never suffer with this again. It's a constant daily battle. It's a constant daily struggle. But don't just give up. I think you'll be surprised. So that's anxiety. How about pride? Pride is another one. I, th I think that uh, we think so highly of ourselves. What we have, what we can do, what we know. See, pride at the end of the day turns from finding satisfaction in God and turns and says, I'm going to find satisfaction in self and what I can do. How can, I, how can I do this? And again, we live in a country that is very prideful, very arrogant. They're enamored with ourselves. We're enamored with ourselves. And we think we can do this. And for a time, we might be able to fool ourselves and even other people around us. I'm finding satisfaction in myself. The problem is, that is a very fragile identity. It's a very fragile thing to base it on because inevitably age or things outside of your control happen and all of a sudden the things that you were priding yourself on, the things that you thought, look at what I can do, and all of a sudden you get a little bit older and a younger generation is coming up and they're faster than you and they're better than you and they're quicker than you. And I don't know about you, but I don't really like that. And now you have to live with that fact. You were, you were so prideful, so arrogant on those things. And all of a sudden it's being taken away from you. Or even your pride in the, 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 the money that you have, or, the, or the, the ability you have to make that money. And, and it's there, and all of a sudden the stock market takes a turn that nobody saw coming. And you're broke, or you're way less under than what you used to be. What do you do? And see, the proof becomes in the pudding because all of a sudden, guess what? You, you, your actions and the way you interact with other people changes. You ever see that? Somebody else is sharp. They're not pleasant to be around anymore. So many people that are close to us pay the penalties and the prices for our refusal to trust God and His future grace. Because we're trying to find satisfaction in ourselves instead of in God. And when that's not working, when that's not happening, all of a sudden, man, we are the worst person in the world to be around because you were never made or designed to satisfy yourself because at the end of the day, you can't. None of the things are really in your control. Who gave you those gifts and abilities? Who can take them away? 
who allowed all your savvy investments in the stock market to work out the way that they did. They might have been bang on investments, but there have been plenty of people who made similar choices and ideas and they lost it all in what was supposed to be a surefire investment over and over and over again. See, you're not really in control of these things. And the very things that you're taking pride and arrogance in are the very things that God is saying, i the one that did all that for you. You have no place to take pride in that. It's from me, and I can take it away in a second. One more. In the realm of sexual satisfaction, or sex. This is again a thought that God cannot satisfy me. They have to find satisfaction in sex. And I will use people to do this for me. Because God is not enough. God is not enough. I'm going to have to find this. I have to make this happen. And I might even question His goodness to me. But like, why would you keep such a good and precious gift away from me? Something I want to enjoy and I want to do it the right way. And you've not given me that spouse to be able to do that with. And so I find and look for it in other places and other people and other, wherever I can find it. And looking at co-workers, or possibly looking at friends, or virtual reality, or online. All realms that God says, this is not how this is to be enjoyed. You can enjoy my good gifts, but not that way. And yet we look for that to do for us, that, to build for us that satisfaction. And, and there's a growing and growing trend of, of, of women being encouraged to kind of pursue those kinds of pursuits in a way that's never been really traditional for them. They're, you know, have the, 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 the sex with other relationships, do all these kinds of things. And it feels good, it feels freeing in all these ways. And yet they're coming to the end of themselves and saying, you know what, I am so miserable. I feel so shallow and hollowed out inside because this, this isn't doing anything for me. They said if I acted like a man, I would be fulfilled and I would find this fulfillment and, and, and it's not there. Because you cannot look at that sex, that act, to fulfill, for, fulfill you or satisfy you in any real or meaningful way because it's just not going to happen. It will not happen. You're looking to try to get from an act and from other people what can really rightly only be had from God. It's not going to work. And in the end of the day, and you look at our country, and you look at the way, like all the, all the things that are said about what you can find, what you can have in this, and you look at the aftermath of what happens when people pursue this, relentlessly pursue this, and you see broken homes, and you see disease, and you see people who don't know how to relate to one another anymore, and you see all the consequences, and all these, the, these children born out of wedlock, all these things coming together, and you, you tell me we're better off? You tell me people are finally finding fulfillment? No. We really could, at the end of the day, spend a lot of time here. We're not. But, Joe, could you grab Pastor Daniel for me? We really could spend a lot of time here, but the reality is unbelief affects us in so many ways. And future grace really is the answer to all of that. To trust God that He is and will provide for us the same way that he has in the past. If you want to read more about that or know about that, it all comes from a book called Future Grace. I would encourage you. I think you would be greatly encouraged and challenged by reading through that and, and, and enjoy that. But at the end of the day, unbelief in the promises of God is a very dangerous thing. The most surprising is that you can actually like God, even have a decent relationship with God, I would posit, certainly a believer, and you have not believe him. And there are many people that fall into this trap. They fall prey to these very things. It's subtle, and it can be sneaky, but just like the disciples are not really believing God, and it will have an effect. It's small, but it permeates deeply in and throughout all of us and having far more reaching effects inside of us than we'd ever care to imagine. Look for unbelief in anxiety. Look for unbelief in pride. Look for unbelief in sex and many other things as well, especially when you start to forget that God's past provisions for you. I think that you can do this all for yourself and you can find it in something else other than Him. You are on the dangerous ground of unbelief and it matters. Let's pray. Dearly Father, we thank You for this day that You have graciously given. We're thankful for a study in which we can look at the disciples and they're just simple off comments about bread and how Christ elaborated on that and the dangers of leaven. And the fact of the matter is that they, they, they just really believed or failed to believe that you could provide. That at the end of the day, that was the root cause of all of their problems is there was a lack of belief. And we've seen that several times in Scripture leading up to this point. Specifically with the feeding of the 5,000, there was this obvious time in which they just didn't get it. 
But there were other times too, and really almost reaching ahead at this moment in time, they're not seeing the truth. And yet they knew all kinds of facts, they knew all kinds of things that were true about you. And yet, Lord, it wasn't transitioning from that theoretical to the practical. They weren't living this out. They weren't really understanding or even remembering what you had done. And so they looked at a single piece of bread in that boat as a massive problem that was insurmountable. Instead of looking to you and trusting that you would provide in a real and meaningful way that ultimate satisfaction, even for something as base as hunger, is found in you. And so, God, I thank you for your provision. I thank you for all that you promised to be for us in Christ. Lord, you've already provided for all of us the greatest need that any of us have, our salvation. The fact that when we look at sin and it still falls in the same category, that, that we are not able in and of ourselves to satisfy the demand that is placed upon us to, to pay the penalty of death for ourselves and think that we can escape it or pay it off in some way. We can't. We needed you to provide a way, and you did, in and through your Son. And for all those who are in Christ, Lord, we know we have that. And we rejoice and we are thankful. And so, God, we want to make much of your name. Here and now and in the future. We want to be like the, not like the disciples here, but later. Well, they learn to trust you. They learn to truly believe and change that so that what they knew in their hearts became manifest in their lives to truly trust you. And to know, Lord, that you would be faithful even when it looked impossible, even though it looked like nothing could be done. Lord, help us all to take the loaves of bread in our lives, the insufficiencies, the things that we're questioning, we don't know how it's going to work out, and to put them in your hands and say, Lord, I'm going to give this to you. I'm going to entrust this to you. And watch what you do. Lord, help us to live our lives by the future grace, believing and trusting that you will continue to do in the future what you have always done and been in the past. Thank you for these great promises by which we can live by. In Christ's name, amen. Please stand with me. We're going to sing number 179 in the large black hymnal. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust Him, precious Jesus, save your friend, and I know that He is with me, will be with me to the Jesus, Jesus, how I 
trust him now I proved him more and more Jesus Jesus precious Jesus oh for grace to trust him more seated room having our special announcement for the carport 